uh, thank you that are sticking it out here. Uh, I'm probably a fish out of water, at least at this conference, because I'm not a mobile game developer. Uh, I am an MMORPG developer. And uh, what are MMORPGs? Well, they're online role-playing games with a persistent uh, universe, persistent characters. Uh, so players are leveling up their characters, they're getting stronger, typically they're in 3D environments. And what's sort of interesting with the cross-section of mobile and MMORPG is the history of MMOs, at least in the West. Um, before there were mobile games, before there were Facebook games, uh, the, the central core social gaming experience was entirely through MMOs. In the 1980s, there were multi-user dungeons. They're called MUDs. These are text-based only, so there's no graphics. You're literally just texting back and forth uh, on computers. And then in the 1990s is when the first graphical MMORPGs started. In fact, there was a game called Neverwinter Nights that was done by America Online, and that was one of the very first graphical MMORPGs. Very small number of users. But in the late 1990s was sort of the uh, first phase of true MMORPG development. And this was uh, Ultima Online and EverQuest, which is probably better known. And this was the first time that MMORPGs were commercially viable. Uh, they had hundreds of thousands of users, which translated into millions of dollars each and every month. Uh, the subscription was the dominant uh, business model at the time. Uh, and then in the early, in the 2000s is the proliferation of the genre. In the early part of the 2000s, the aughts, was phase two of MMORPGs, and that's where I got my claim to fame. So from 2001 to 2004, uh, those were the big titles, Dark Age of Camelot, RuneScape, Star Wars Galaxies, and then my game that I created was City of Heroes. And all of these games, again, reached uh, similar levels of popularity to EverQuest, but now we were attracting more and more players. It wasn't just the same group of players we were mining. It was slowly but surely growing. We were finding a spot in stores. And in 2004, World of Warcraft is really what, what exploded uh, MMORPGs into uh, mass market consciousness. Now, what are the challenges to MMOs? Well, the biggest challenge is content. The average player is going to play 20 hours a week. Now, a console game that you purchase for Xbox or PlayStation is generally only going to have 20 hours of content. Well, our players, MMO players, will eat that up in a single week. And so the development response is to create hundreds of quests that are repeatable or that are very similar to one another and very basic and easy to implement. And this is where the term grind comes from. Because in an MMO, if you're playing for hundreds of hours and you're killing rats over and over again, it's a bit of a grind. It becomes kind of like work. But the MMO developer has virtually no choice because if he spends more time to make the same amount of missions, the cost exponentially increases. So, and, and most recently, MMORPGs are competing for social uh, attention. And what I mean by this is, uh, as I said just a few moments ago, that the very th thing that MMOs were developed on were they were the only games that you could play with other people online and you could chat with other people online. Now, really, go back to the late 1990s. We maybe did email, but nobody chatted. There, there was no chat systems were very small, very uh, rudimentary, and certainly not mass market. But you could do it in Ultima Online. You could do it in EverQuest. And that was one of the reasons for the explosion of popularity. Well, now MMOs, uh, Facebook offers just as much utility for conversation and communication as an MMO does. So how does an MMO differentiate itself? How does it differentiate itself, say, from Puzzles and Dragons, where I'm not actually playing with my friends, but I can borrow one of his uh, creatures to fight on my team. So there's a sense that it's a multiplayer experience, even if it's not a true one. So I'm going to skip for a second into user-generated content and a little bit about the history of that. And we're going to weave these two together in a minute. So user-generated content started in the 90s. And the biggest uh, beginning was Doom. When Doom came out, many players began making their own variants and modifications to that game. And 
These are a couple of famous ones. That's a Batman mod. That was one of the early ones. Uh, obviously, it wasn't licensed. The other one, which of course is uh, pitch black. Uh, I don't know if you get this in mobile games, but artists and MMOs love everything pitch black. Uh, that's an Aliens mod. Somebody did a, a mod for uh, the Aliens movie. Now, uh, first-person shooters with these mod mods essentially ended up acting as advertisements for the base game. Uh, you would see them, it would expand the lifetime of the game, you'd go and buy a copy because your friend had told you about this mod. So first there was Doom, then there was Quake, which was even bigger. Well, in the early part of the uh, 2000s, Neverwinter Nights came out and offered a suite of tools for players to create their own, essentially, video game, uh, their own server, uh, and it was given tools not unlike what developer tools would be. So uh, you can see it's pretty advanced, but there had never had been anything like this in the video game industry. There was never before an attempt uh, to open up Pandora's box of creativity. And as a result, Neverwinter Nights was a smash hit. I believe it sold something like three million copies, which was enormous. It was a PC title only. And Tens of thousands of people tried their hand at creating their own stuff. Now, the problem is, number one, it was pretty complicated, and, and it also required a high degree of technical sophistication to set up your servers. But still, this is when UGC uh, started breaking into the gamer market. In the mass market, the most important product that everybody in this room should know about is Second Life. Second Life is a quasi-MMO that achieved enormous notoriety uh, around 2004, 2005, 2006. Uh, essentially, it was a game about nothing. It was kind of like Seinfeld. It was entirely player driven. So it, it basically just was a blank slate and players would create content, upload assets, and build on that area. And then they would use scripting tools to create game logic or behavior logic or AI logic. And you, you might have seen news articles about how people were creating their own universities or their own states or you know, uh, any number of different things within the Second Life world because it was meant to be a Second Life. Uh, the monet uh, monetization system also was unlike anything anybody had ever seen. You rented plots of land and uh, the, the company that ran Second Life, Linden Labs, would take a piece of any item that players sold to one another in an auction house. So I could create a boat, sell it to you in-game for microtransaction points, and then I would get the microtransaction money, I could back it out of the system and actually make money out of this. In fact, one of my artists bought his motorcycle by selling things on Second Life. It's a true story, not, not a... So, what does this mean for MMOs and free-to-play, right? Now I'm going to jump back into MMOs. The MMO market was traditionally uh, subscription-based. So someone would go into a store, uh, purchase their copy, and then they would sign up, and they would have to pay a monthly fee, usually about $15 a month, uh, month in and month out, and get, that's the only way they could play. Otherwise, that was it if you didn't pay. Uh, it's kind of an odd thing. It, it was an outgrowth of basically internet charges, which were monthly back then. So there was a huge change in, in our thinking, which actually helped inform the mobile market, and that's free-to-play. Free-to-play start was actually in MMOs, and it all originated in China for a whole variety of different reasons. But essentially in China, uh, the idea of paying for a box didn't exist because you couldn't sell it. Piracy is too ri rife in China. You can't sell anything. Uh, in a store uh, that's computer uh, software, and at least at that time. Uh, in addition, uh, the business model, for whatever reason, of players, they preferred paying things in smaller chunks. So the Chinese MMO companies became enormous, and I should note that's partially because there's no other game besides MMOs because everything's online. There's no box stuff, and there are no consoles. There's no PlayStation, there's no Xbox. So massive MMOs develop in China. Huge, immensely successful. Well, here in America, we say, huh, well, that's interesting. And in 2009, uh, an MMO decides to switch from subscription to free to play, Dungeons and Dragons. And it had very good success, at least that we know of. 
typically when free to play happens in an MMO, they, they kind of chop up the game into bite sized bits and sell it to you. So you might not get into a zone or an area of the game unless you pay for it. You might not get this costume unless you pay for it. Uh, it's sort of an a la carte method so that somebody isn't paying a big chunk of money all at once, they're paying lots of little chunks at a time. Now, how this wraps into Cryptic, and at least what we're, tr we're trying to do with Neverwinter, and how this links to UGC, is that we feel that free players are a critical part of the ecosystem. So in other words, a free player can contribute something that a paying player can't. If you leave at all my talk with anything, it's, it's this. So in our games now, players can get online and grind or do very hard, difficult missions to acquire special currency. We call it dilithium in Star Trek, and Neverwinter we call it astral diamonds. And this is stuff that you really need time. You have to spend some effort to earn it. And with this currency in-game, you can buy really good gear, the best swords, the best armor, great stuff. So you want to have it. And so there's only a few places where you can earn this. You can't just get Astro Diamonds and Dilithium. This time currency doesn't just fall off trees. Now the key thing here in this extremely complicated chart is that we have an auction house which allows players who have that time currency to sell it to other players. So if, let's say, I want to purchase some Astral Diamonds that my friend Arsene has, he's been playing tons. Then he gets the money to buy microtransactions and I get the currency to buy the gear. I'm a paying player. And as we know, paying players make up the vast minority of players. Usually in a free-to-play MMO, 10% is the number. I know with mobile games, it's even far less. But the, the best part about that vast minority is that they're willing to spend a lot more than we think. They're enthusiasts. They like the game. They want to give you their money. And if they can give their money to someone else so that that person can then go mi buy microtransaction items and then they can go get the best gear in the game, so much the better. And it's not pay to win, right? It's play to win. Somebody has to be actually earning the currency. We're not selling it. We're just enabling two players to exchange uh, uh, um, to, to exchange currencies. So now, the free player is actually performing a service for the paying player and vice versa. They're both necessary parts of the gaming ecosystem. So, what does this mean for user-generated content? And what is user-generated content? Well, at least in Neverwinter, we provide a set of tools, not unlike the previous Neverwinter Nights games, but uh, where you can create your own adventures, your own quests. You can create a village filled with werewolves. You can go rescue a maiden from a dragon in a castle. We provide players with all of the same art assets that we have in game, as well as a 3D editor, a mission editor, even a costume editor, create their own characters. And so that they can go through and create as much content as they want, and they can publish it into our game. I'll show you exactly how it's, it's accessed. Now, commonly, as I said, the business model is to take a subscription game and make it a la carte. And frequently, you'll see other MMORPGs selling their content. And as a result, and this is DLC, usually we, they use that term. But there's a problem here. I just gave you a number, 10%. If only 10% of people buy something, and only 10% of the people buy a piece of content, let's say a really great dungeon with a really great monster in it. The really problem is, the problem there is it's 10% of the, the player base that's going to that dungeon. And the number one reason why people stop playing an MMORPG is because their friends stop playing. You need a critical mass of people in MMORPGs, even in mobile games, in order to keep, to sustain the game. Because when people don't find other people to play with or play against, they're not going to play. So as soon as somebody sells content, they're fracturing their player base and increase likelihood of losing someone. 
So what does that mean for us? It means that we don't charge anything for user-generated content. And in fact, we try to make user-generated content part of the game. So when you first log into Neverwinter, and it's free to play, so you could all download it tonight if you want, uh, you will see a calendar of events. And in this calendar, we have all sorts of things that are happening. There's always something to do. And one of those things, user-generated content. You can just click right on it, and you'll see a full list of all the things that people have created for one another. Players rank each other's adventures. You can sort by the creator. You can sort by how many stars it has. Uh, there's any number of different things, and there are literally thousands upon thousands of quests that have been uh, created over the past several months. And so that's just one way to encounter uh, the content. The other way is actually in the game. So this is a character in the game called a Harper, and if you go to that Harper and you click on him, he'll say, you know, I've, I've heard some mysterious things are going on, and here they are. And then it will list all of the player-created missions and quests that take place in the nearby vicinity to the Harper. So what we tried to do is make it so that player-created missions and content are seamlessly part of Neverwinter so that you don't tell the difference. Players feel engaged and as if they are part of the development and creative process. And we encourage this. And the key here is we don't monetize it. Because even if a UGC player isn't giving us any money whatsoever, he's providing a service. It's part of the philosophy that I mentioned earlier. It's part of that gaming ecosystem. That person is creating content for other people to play. The more people that play, the more people that will eventually end up paying, assuming that constant 10%, which isn't what it is for Neverwinter. It's actually different. But that's just sort of a, a ballpark figure, 10%. This is actually a, a, a very bad screenshot that it looks like the title got cut off of, um, of what our user-generated content looks like. And essentially, our goal was to make it so that it felt like you could construct a story. And so each of these little blocks represented a different quest element. Let's say you had to go to a, uh, a talk to somebody. So you would drag and drop, interact with other, w interact with an NPC, and you drag it in here. And say, okay, well, after that, I want to kill some uh, kobolds. So you drag a kill mission, right? And then in between each of these, you'd have a map, and you define the map. And once you do that, you go over to the map slide, you put down the map, then you have to put down the critters. We tried to make it intuitive. We tried to link it to storytelling. That's essentially the, the point of view we wanted to make. Um, and it was a 3D... Uh, uh, experience, you can get in the map, you can uh, kind of choose to move stuff around. In essence, the reason why I'm explaining this is that we tried to make it slightly more accessible than what user-generated content in, in Second Life or uh, the previous Neverwinter Nights uh, titles were. Uh, even more importantly, players uh, do not uh, need to set any servers up because it's all on our server, it's all live. So you don't need to do anything whatsoever. Now, as I said, the, there is absolutely zero charge for what, what uh, any form of user-generated content. And that means that every time we produce new assets for our game, we will then divvy those up, cut them up, and give them to our creators to be able to use in our foundry. That's the name of the user-generated content tool. And even more importantly, remember I mentioned that time currency? When you play through a user-generated content mission, after you're done, you have the option to tip the creator with those, whoop, with those uh, astral diamonds. And so players right now are literally earning gear by uh, having other players tip them in game for the missions they've created. So even passively, you can sit back and never win her. And just by being a, a, a good creator, you, you can end up earning swords and armor, shields, all the best stuff, which is kind of a, it's an interesting thing that, that cre we're trying to reward creation. Because in the end, these people are just as vital, the user-generated content people, as my own development team. Because they're extending the life of the game. And doing it faster and more efficiently than I could do myself. And that's it. Is there uh, any, any questions? Yeah. Hello. Oh, 
loud. I have two questions. One is related to the quality of the content. I'm not familiar with what is going on with the UGC in Neverwinter, but I, the rule of thumb for uh, the city of games is that a lot of the really popular ones were origin stories for the creators, player characters, mm. and I'm wondering if there's something similar that's happening in Neverwinter. And the second question I have is the sort of rule of thumb is that 1% of your users are going to actually create the user-generated content, 10% are going to play it, and everyone else is, is going to ignore it. Is, is your breakdown a little bit different? Uh, yeah, I'd say our breakdown is a little bit different from, from those general numbers. I'd say that uh, creators probably are closer to 5% for us. And then, of course, only a fraction of that are actually making good content. Because um, you know, most people are going to get in and not do much. Uh, it's not easy to create good, compelling content. Uh, as far as what's most popular, uh, right now, what tends to be popular are uh, really good storylines that basically anything that feels like Neverwinter is a Dungeons and Dragons uh, uh, IP. And so it all comes back to what feels like Dungeons and Dragons. And if you've ever sat around a table uh, and rolled some dice, um, that's essentially the experience that, that people remember fondly. And those are the types of adventures which play well. Uh, the other really popular thing is whenever somebody uses our tools in, in, in ways that we never foresaw, like there's a bar fight one that's really good that we didn't know even how he created it. It was crazy uh, because it was all these weird dialogue trees which triggered other things. Uh, so those tend to be popular because they're so different than what the mainstream. Um, I don't know what our percentage of I, I, player, uh, how many people have actually played <coughs> the missions, but I do, the creator's about 5%. Yeah. How do you break down revenue between your whales and highly engaged folks versus these different ways of monetizing? Uh, how do I break up? I'm not sure I understand the question enough. So in terms of how you make your money, does it come from highly engaged users that are creating content who are getting, I guess, uh, time synced uh, synced out of the system versus people paying money for uh, other types of... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, at least as far as what I just demonstrated, you can expect that it's not the majority, the majority of your money is made off of straight microtransactions, uh, or at least for us. However, a significant portion, i.e., you know, greater than 10%, is basically people who receive money from other buyers in exchange for that time currency or in exchange for user-generated content. So, uh, it's a significant bump to uh, revenue. Like when our auction house goes down, it, it, it cuts our sales across the board. Uh, and it's very noticeable. Any other questions? Uh, my question is, do you have uh, refund issues with the auction house? No, actually. Yeah, okay. no. Because it's entirely between players, and it's 100%, and uh, it's a blind auction. So uh, it's kind of hard to game the system. Uh, so at the moment, none, no. Okay. It's kind of weird, actually. It's a good point. You'd think that happened all the time. But. When players are doing the um, uh, content that's been created by other players, can they earn the time currency for that as well? And like, how do you kind of balance for that? So uh, yeah, we have a certain amount of time currency which is given like a daily mission. You can do U the UGC content, but typically it isn't because otherwise people are going to do their best to create a mission to get max. It's all about incentives. People will maximize whatever gives them the, the greatest reward in the shortest amount of time possible. And if somebody can create a mission where they can get you know, oodles of XP and oodles of gold and astral diamonds, then they'll do it, right? Even if it's boring as hell. Um, and you don't want your players bored because then they stop playing altogether. So you, yeah, we really have to watch that. Sorry, Wait, the mic moved around. Um, what, what methods do you guys have in place for making sure that um, players who are experiencing player-generated content experience a broad range of player-generated content rather than it just going to like the top voted things that, you know, the app store problem. Yeah, I, you know what, we, we don't at all. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I guess because, at least from our perspective, it's whatever people want to play and enjoy. And we don't worry about the variety because we just let the market decide. The invisible hand of the market. Are, are you concerned that over time that'll result in people who are the content creators who aren't at the top, like being bummed out that other people aren't playing their stuff? The, there's a, in the rating mechanism, there's an automatic decay. Uh, so we sync older things over time so that other things begin to go up. So far, we haven't had any issues, but you know, it might be something in two years we have to look at. Any other questions? Great.